So we're excited to share this virtual lecture with all of you titled South Atlantic Seascape, Connections Between Habitats, Fish, and People. Today's topic will be presented by Mary Conley, TNC's Southeast Marine Conservation Director, and Bob Crimian, TNC's Southeast Ocean Conservation Specialist. So without further ado, Mary and Bob, let me hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kate. We're so excited to be here today. Um, I've had the chance to go to Blowing Rocks a couple of different times and it really is a remarkable location. So happy to um, share this presentation um, with friends and um, staff and others who also find Blowing Rocks to be a special place. Um, as Kate mentioned, my name is Mary Conley. I'm the Southeast Director of Marine Conservation with the Nature Conservancy. And our presentation today is really going to focus on how we look regionally at ocean and marine conservation work across the Southeast United States, and then dive a little bit deeper into one specific area of our work, which is related to sustainable fisheries. So I'll do the first part of the presentation and kind of give an overview of our Southeast marine conservation efforts. And then we'll take the pause for some questions before passing it to Bob Crimian, my colleague, to share information related to fisheries. Bob, if you can move to the next slide. So we really live in a remarkable place here in the Southeast. If we think about the types of habitats and species that we have to conserve, um, everything from our coastal habitats, our mangroves and salt marshes, seagrass bed and oysters, to the species that move between different habitats, be it a sea turtle that spends part of its time on the beach nesting, and another part all the way out in the Sargasso Sea um, feeding off of algae in the water to our seafloor habitats that provide places for fish to feed, places to hide. The picture on the bottom left is of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And the picture on the bottom far right is Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. So two amazing hard bottom areas um, that really provide biodiversity and support a wide variety of um, fish and other species. In addition to this amazing ecological value, next slide. Our natural systems along the Southeast coast have an important socioeconomic component to them as well. We know about the number of folks who come from a tourism um, standpoint or ecotourism with kayaking and boating and fishing. Um, we have larger cities located along the coast where up to 50% of the total population across the country makes their home. Commercial fishing as a high priority area, the military with their training areas and their coastal bases, um, and then thinking about some of the newer uses that are potentially coming into our region or being discussed things like alternative energy or the deepening of many of our ports and what that means in terms of how we can think about future uses alongside existing uses. How do we connect the people aspect with our natural system components? And that's really the emphasis of the South Atlantic Seascape Program. Next slide. So the South Atlantic Seascape was created a little over 15 years ago when our states from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida came together to really create a marine program that emphasized how we can work not only from learn from our experience in the terrestrial realm doing land conservation, preservation, and restoration, but move more into the aquatic realm thinking about how do we think about new uses and the protection of our coastal and marine habitats. So we're now 15 going on 16 years old. Next. So we're a bit of a teenager. We're trying to get our heads wrapped around where we go next and the opportunities that come with it. And along those lines, the Conservancy has actually looked to connect our South Atlantic marine work further with the great work that's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. 
acknowledging that both from a standpoint of habitats as well as species and partners, there's a connection between the two. Next slide. And in those last 15 years, we've gotten some really great work done. As Kate mentioned at the beginning, TNC is an organization that's based on science. We're global and we work to collect our global and national work to touch down at home where we live and with what we're doing. Some of the cool things that have been accomplished over the last 15 years has been some science and monitoring around alternative ways to restore oyster reefs and do living shorelines. We also created a regional map of the South Atlantic seascape, identifying key hard bottom areas and linking those to fish species and how they're related to each other. Information and science that we and our partners can use in helping to make management decisions. Next. And we're bringing that idea of science onto the ground. So we've had the opportunity to complete over 15 living shoreline projects across the Southeast states. We've been working on oyster restoration and fisheries work that touches down with the communities and leaves a legacy on the land as well as with the policy that it can help inform. Next slide. And we don't do this alone. One of the great things that I love about working with the Conservancy is the number of partners that we get to engage, be it federal, state, and local governments, to community groups, citizens, and um, local private landowners. We really work to bring our information together in a way that engages those that we work with and those that will be influenced by the decisions made. The picture here is actually of a coastal resilience workshop that we held in South Carolina, where we brought together community groups around Georgetown to talk about flooding issues across the um, Georgetown, South Carolina area. Next. And over the last 15 years, when I was brought on board 15 years ago, I was the first full-time marine conservation staff um, within the North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia chapters. And since that time, we've really grown to a team that's over 50 people working across multiple states on a variety of different issues. And then through our regional program, having the opportunity to learn from and build science that connects us in the same way that in the ocean, species connect us from one location to another. Similar to what we were talking about with the loggerhead turtle or, or a, whale or a tuna moving up and down the coast as they migrate over time. Next slide. So what is it that we work on? We really are focused on what we call our healthy oceans. How do we define and enable a healthy ocean in the future? What are the things that we need to protect and conserve? The critical habitats and avoiding negative impacts from other uses. How do we think about the role of our ocean in terms of mitigating climate through offshore energy, thinking about where, where wind energy may be sited and what's the relationship between offshore wind energy and the ecological and other human uses that are already going on in the ocean? What's the role or understanding the value of our coastal habitats like mangroves and salt marsh and seagrasses? that actually help to sequester carbon. And therefore it's important to both maintain and restore them as part of a blue carbon solution to climate change. And as we think about managing or mitigating climate change through reducing our carbon, how do we also work to enable both people and nature to adapt to it using nature as a critical component of what that can be, the role of coral reefs and mitigating wave energy, the role of salt marshes and helping to sequester storms that come on bo in board. And even thinking about the role nature can play in terms of mitigating flooding to the, where we place and how we put in storm management systems. And finally, healthy oceans is nothing if not connected to our sustainable fisheries. To have fisheries, we need healthy oceans from water quality to the habitats and the people who fish 
also want to be part of the solution as to how we allow fishing to be continued, but in a way that enables us to maintain the habitats and have healthy populations and food webs. Next slide. So across the Southeast with our South Atlantic seascape from Virginia now all the way to Louisiana as part of our oceans and coast network, we're focused on three main things. And I just wanna give a little bit of a note about why we care. And then I'll, we'll pass it on to Bob to give an example of how the work touches down in the ground. The first is ocean protection. The South Atlantic seascapes makes up about 56% of our Atlantic seashore with a coastal population over 12 million people. When we think about protection in our ocean, we often think about it as marine protected areas, things like the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary or Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. The total area of our coast offshore waters that fall under those categories is less than 40%. And there are efforts to try to increase that number, but also acknowledging that just place-based protection will not get us to where we need to go to ensure that the biodiversity and the habitats and the food web are maintained. So we think of this not only in terms of place, but in terms of what types of uses go where and how can we best inform that and have the science to bring us into play to know what's important and where the potential conflicts are rise. The map on the right is a map that shows some of the prior priority areas of seafloor habitat and migratory species that were identified as part of our South Atlantic Bite Marine Assessment. And we use this data to think about how we comment on things like siting of offshore energy, be it the oil and gas that was being discussed over the last several years to the future of offshore aquaculture that may be coming into play. Thinking about how we layer and we think collectively about conserving as well as smart use of our oceans. Next slide. Along the coast, we've all seen the number of storms that have hit the Southeast over the last five years and the impacts of those storms from inland flooding from rivers that move downstream to storm surges and coastal erosion. The Southeast in many places have a, has a unique opportunity to conserve the existing natural systems that are already helping our communities um, be safe or have lessened impacts from some of these storms. And there's opportunities to continue to enhance, to enhance that through restoration. So our work here is really working with local governments and policymakers to think about how we conserve and restore these critical coastal habitats and ensuring that green infrastructure is under consideration at the same time that we think about where our gray infrastructure is placed so that it is less impacted and we can have a more adaptable future as climate continues to impact our areas. Next slide. And finally, sustainable fisheries. The Southeast has a lot of information and data that is collected for our fish species. However, almost 68, over, about 68% 68 of stocks, both state and federally managed across the Southeast are data poor. What that means is that we don't have the information on their current populations or there's limited data to understand the amount of catch that goes into it from a commercial or a recreational standpoint. But fishing is critical in this region, particularly recreational fishing. Southeast has the two largest recreational fisheries in the entire United States. And these are conservation folks who are interested in ensuring that our habitats are protected. And our commercial fishery is also important, our shrimp and our crabs and our oysters. So how can we work with fishermen to both help fill gaps in data as well as protect habitats and restore habitats so that we're working together for the health of our oceans. So I'm going to pause here because we're gonna pass the floor over to Bob in just a moment so he can dig a little bit deeper into the fisheries work. And I'll let Hannah kind of guide us through any questions that maybe have come up as we've been talking. 
Anna. Sure thing. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, the first question we have here is, how can estuary programs aid in conservation? Well, I think estuary programs are actually critical to be thinking about conservation. The great thing about estuary programs is that they're already looking at the combination of the natural resources, as well as the people who live in and around the estuary. So I think there's opportunity in terms of research, what type of information and data can we collect in an estuary? Education and outreach, how do you work out to, to we'll reach out to the communities that are around and near those estuary programs? And one of the things I would love for us to continue to see is the connection between our estuaries and our offshore habitats. Um, you know, there are so many fish species who spend part of their time in an estuary and then move offshore. So how can our estuary programs connect with those offshore environments as well? So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We do have another question from Saima that just came through on Facebook. Um, and they asked to clarify, did you mean 4% protected area, not 40%? Yes, I meant 4%. When we look at the amount that's actually designated as a marine protected area based on um, from the Marine Protected Area Center, which is led by the National Oceanic and o Atmospheric Administration, it is 4% of the ocean that fits that guidelines. Now, there are some other um, specific you know, limitations on what you can do in the ocean. So for instance, from a fishery standpoint, there are areas where you're not allowed to do bottom trawling in order to minimize impacts on habitats like what I have behind me, which is a site at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Well, if you ran a trawl over that, imagine what could happen to those beautiful coral species that are growing on the hard bottom. So when you start to add that in, the number goes up, but the Full designation is um, four percent, and uh, from the and from an offshore standpoint. Thank you so much for clarifying. Just going to give another moment if anyone has another question and they want to raise their hand, or if they want to drop it in the chat. If not, thank you so much, Mary, and we can pass the mic to Bob. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Mary. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So, yeah, so as I was introduced, Bob Cremian here. Um, I work with Mary Connolly and all this great work we're doing here. And I'm going to taking a deeper dive into our fisheries work specifically, which is one of our main pillars here. So why fisheries? Well, first, it's a TNC focus to ensure healthy oceans, as Mary mentioned earlier. And as well as she mentioned, you cannot have healthy oceans without sustainable fisheries. They are connected, very much so. Um, so if without working on fisheries, our healthy oceans goals would not be possible. Additionally, data gaps. So what we don't know is actually hurting us. And when I say us, I actually do mean people. Because even though it may not seem like it, the health of our fish populations in the ocean directly relates to the health of humans as well. Because Many, many people depend on fish as their main protein source. If we do not know how many fish are in the ocean, we do not know how many fish are left, and therefore there could be some sort of food insecurity. In addition to that though, low fish populations can also mean bad or um, degraded fish habitat, which is also important. Additionally, there's a capacity issue. Governments are stretched beyond capacity to really effectively manage fisheries. As you know, fish move, they don't stay in within state lines or even within country lines sometimes. So it is up to other groups such as the Nature Conservancy to help governments out where we can to effectively manage this fish species as best as possible. As I said earlier, sustainable fisheries need healthy habitats. So in the South Atlantic in particular, there's a direct connection between our habitats and our fisheries. As you can see here, there's a picture of some things you can see in Florida, for instance, such as coral reefs, oyster reefs, mangrove forests, and sandy shoals. And having these habitats be at
Oh, it looks like we experienced just a little bit of technical difficulty. Mary, are you able, if I share screen, to pick up? Yep. If you share screen, I'm happy to pick up. All right. Let me get that opened up. Thanks, everyone, for your patience with that. I'll see if I can do as well as Bob did, it has um, would have done. PowerPoint's not wanting to play nice. All right. Can you see the full screen? I can. So if you want to, uh, well, actually it's showing up in presentation mode right now. Of course it is. <laughs> you know. There we go. Yeah. So if you could just keep that, go ahead down to those fishery slides. Perfect. All right. So go up a couple. Back I just to wanted to mention, I just readmitted Bob. So he might be joining us again shortly. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry, everybody. My computer literally just like blanked. So yeah. something happened. I'm not quite sure what I'm back on now. Um, I am I screen sharing, Bob, if that's yes, all right. You want to just go off my screen? If that's okay with you, that'd be fantastic. And Kate, I think if you could just go up one more slide is where we were. One more. One more, I think. One more, yep. There we go. Great, thank you so much. So again, my sincere apologies. I'm gonna keep my camera off as well, just so my computer is not freaking out too much. Um, so I was saying that fish are directly connected to our habitats and specifically the snapper grouper complex is what we are currently working on. This is the largest fish complex within the South Atlantic region here. You can see there on the right-hand side, that is the South Lake Fishery Management Council in their jurisdiction. They are the ones who directly manage federally managed species. And there are over 55 individual species within the snapper grouper complex. So it is a large and a um, very varied complex of fish, which makes it sometimes very hard to manage. In addition to this, there's poor recreational data. Um, these are very sought after recreational species. And the amount of catch and effort happening within this complex in the recreational sector is very low. So they do need some help there. Additionally, this connection to hard bottom habitat, whether that's deep water coral reefs, such as Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, or shallow water coral reefs, such as in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, there's a direct connection between these fish and these habitats. So with helping protect habitat, that helps the snapper grouper species in addition to that. Um, also overfished. So Every species of fish that is overfished within the South Atlantic comes from the snapper grouper complex. So there is a direct connection here where there's a lot of fishing pressure on these fish in particular. And without the proper data, we really don't know how poor or how well they might be rebounding from fishery management efforts. And additionally, being one of the South Atlantic seascape, there is a regional management component to this complex that fits well within our priorities. Next slide. Yeah. Bob, you somehow got muted again. Okay, can you hear me again? Yeah. Okay, so sorry. So again, as I said, said earlier, this connection to lot bomb habitat. So the map on the right-hand side, that is a map that um, comes from our South Lake Bite Marine Assessment that Mary introduced earlier. This shows the most up-to-date um, locations of various types of hard bomb habitat from your inshore um, shallow coral reefs down to the Keys, which isn't shown in this particular map, to our offshore habitats where there are coral reefs and hard bomb habitats that are over a hundred feet deep. So very different habitats. But again, connection from this near shore habitat where um, 
fish tend to grow up as juveniles as they move to the offshore, to these offshore habitats. So again, this connection to habitat and fish is very apparent within particularly the snapper grouper complex. Next slide, please. In addition, when you're talking about fisheries management, it does equal and affect ocean protection. A lot of our protections within ocean habitat come from fishery management. So as I said before, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council has a bunch of different marine protected areas that they have designated for fish species, particularly snapper grouper. And they range in size from very small areas, such as the map on the left hand side, those are spawning areas. So very, very small, almost point locations within the ocean where there are known spotting aggregates where fish reproduce. She then can move to very large areas all the way to the right hand side where you see that bright teal area. That's the area that Mary talked about earlier where you're now the bottom trawl. So again, if you were to rake essentially the bottom of the seafloor there, that's a potential hazard where you're talking about damaging the reefs. So they can range in very wide areas. Next slide, please. So how do we do this work? Mostly we are doing with management, but also with recreational fishermen. They are our conservation voices. And we always liken fishermen to hunters on the land. Hunters do a great job of advocating for the land that they like to hunt on. And they wanna preserve the areas and the species that they find interesting and want to engage with. Fishermen are the same way for the oceans. So working with fishermen directly lends its voice to ocean conservation. Um, additionally, there are problems that both fishermen and managers agree on and want to solve. And that's not always the easiest thing to do. So there's three particular areas that we really do focus on at this point. One is discard mortality, which is essentially fish that die that are not kept. So if you release a fish, but the fish ends up dying anyway, that's a problem that both fishermen and managers want to solve. Additionally, numerous data gaps. So as we talked about before, poor data um, for snapper grouper species and inefficient protected areas. So areas that are under current protection, but we're really not sure how well they are working. So better monitoring of those areas. All this work requires trust. And that takes a lot of time to build as many of us know from just our past relations with many different people. So building trust over years of time has really led us to a point where we can work with fishermen as we um, continue this work. Next slide, please. So an entry point here with us um, at the Nerdy Circuit Jersey is introducing the idea of descending devices to reduce discard mortality, specifically with snapper grouper, deep water snapper grouper species. As you can see the picture on the left here, this is a red snapper, very sought after recreational and commercial species. And out of its mouth there is its stomach. So as a fish is brought up from depth, say maybe past 50 feet or so, the pressure difference from their habitat at the bottom of the ocean to the surface changes and their bodies expand because of that change in pressure. It's kind of like when a scuba diver sometimes gets the bends. When you come up from the surf to the surface too quickly and the gases in your body expand. This happens to fish, deep water fish in particular. And this is something that we really, really want to try to avoid because this can be lethal. The picture on the right shows what a mature red snapper, about 30 inches, can equal over a hundred different fish it could reproduce. So say you have one 30 inch red snapper that dies, unfortunately after it's released, that could mean potentially a hundred other red snappers that are not born. Can you click on the next point, please? So this is an image actually from offshore Northeast Florida where they were fishing for red snapper. But again, red snapper have a very short fishing season and you have a certain size requirement in previous years. So if you can't keep a red snapper, you have to return to the ocean. But many red snapper go through barotrauma and this is what happens if you do not have the proper mechanisms to release the fish back down to the bottom. They float. Fishermen call them floaters often. And this is a scene that we do not want to see because this is lots of fish that are not being kept to be sold or kept for recreational purposes or returned to the ocean for the purposes of survival, but they do not make it. So this is something we do not want. Could you click one more time, please? 
Yes, red X, no, don't want that. Could you click one more time? And again, there we go. So this is a descendant. This is a version of a descending device. There are many different kinds, but this is essentially a device that allows the fish to get from the surface to the bottom in a safe manner to increase its chances of survival. And that's what we're looking for here. Um, could you click one more time? Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this works. We're gonna show you a video of the same device in action. So bear with me for one moment. Can everybody see my screen and still hear me? Yes. Great, okay. So this here is a picture of a red grouper that was caught off the coast of North Carolina. As you can see, the eyes is bulging out. That is also a sign of bear trauma. Also, the body is very bloated. This means that it is too buoyant. There's too much gas in the body to hit for itself just went back down to the bottom. So this is gonna show you the same device in action here to help save this fish. So they are hooking up the descending device to the fish right now. This is a GoPro camera they've attached to the fishing line here. So we can see this happen. So the fish is put in there and this particular device, you set it to a particular depth and the device will automatically open at that depth. As you can see here, the fish, its gills are still inflated out, its eyes are bulged out and its body is inflated. When it gets to a particular depth, the body is gonna morph back into its regular self, which is what we want. That means it's back to its normal state. Maybe happy in three, two, one, there we go. So the fish gets back to its state. This is where we want fish to do. Get back to a place where it can swim by itself. And at the particular depth that this device is set, it will automatically open and the fish can swim away and continue to live, which was the intention. That's why people do catch and release. So there you go, automatically opens, you can see the fish start to swim away in the distance. The cool thing about this is, this is from NC State. They tagged this red grouper here. It was then caught again six months later. So it shows that this type of device can really help um, increase the chances of survival of these species. So I'm going to stop sharing. If you could share your screen again, that'd be great so we can continue the presentation. Thank you very much. So we've been doing this work in various areas. One of them is in Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. So this is again, a more deep water reef, unlike the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, it's about 17 miles off the coast of Sapelo Island. And they have a lot of different snapper grouper species here. And this sanctuary is open for fishing. So we've worked with the sanctuary and the fishermen that fish in the sanctuary to increase this idea of best fishing practices and using the same devices. It has actually been such a good idea that the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council is actually putting a regulation that now requires these types of devices to be on board if you are fishing for snapper grouper, which is a big plus for conservation. So we're very excited about that. Next slide, please. We're also doing work in Southeast Florida where all of you guys, or most of you, are located near Blowing Rocks Preserve. The next picture here is David Moss. He is a new ER hire for the Nature Conservancy based in Boynton Beach, and he is our fisheries project manager for Florida. And he is working within Southeast Florida to reach recreational fishermen, but also fishing influencers, guys and gals who have a media presence or a following to help spread the message about best fishing practices. And this idea of using descending devices when encountering fish that go through bear trauma. As you see in the map here, Florida, Southeast Florida is bright red. Lots of people are down there. Actually, most of the fishing pressure within the South Atlantic region comes from Southeast Florida from a recreational standpoint. So it's, we're very excited to have David on board for this work going forward. Next slide. Another idea of this is once you start to build trust with fishermen and show them videos such as the one I showed you all, they start to really want to help. And one of the ways to help is through filling data gaps, particularly recreational data gaps. And there are ways to do that, such as through phone applications. Um, the South Atlantic Fishing Management Council has an um, app called Release. And this, you can record 
the fish that you are actually releasing back into the ocean, which is a very important number that um, fishery managers need to know. With this app, you can also record if you're using a descending device. And this is important to help kind of get a sense of who is complying with that regulation. Knowing this information helps improve stock assessments, which is how fishery management determine how much fish, fish can be caught. So to improve stock assessment, there'll be more trust from fishermen in fisheries management, which helps overall compliance, which helps sustainable fisheries improve which then in turn helps healthy oceans. So that's kind of our line of thought here working in this realm. Next slide, please. We also want to have on water engagement. That's why me and David and Mary love this work. We love being out on the water. Unfortunately, COVID has made that very difficult. So pictures here show a trip that I recently, uh, not recently, took before COVID really started back in 2020. This here, the guy in the um, cap there is, um, a charter captain from St. Mary's, Georgia. And we went on a fishing trip using descending devices and he loved this stuff. He was so awesome. He's telling all his people that are coming to this fishing charter about it. So we wanna have more trips like this to really garner this conservation voice to help spread this message about using this device, which can help improve fisheries populations and improve fisheries management. So I think that's the last slide, yes. And then from there, I will take any questions that people may have. And again, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties before. Great, well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Bob and Mary and um, all of our viewers for hanging in there with us with those technical glitches, but um, it was a great presentation. I know I learned so much and uh, I hope that you all feel comfortable to um, unmute yourselves if you have questions or um, drop your questions and comments into the chat. And then Hannah, I'll hand it over to you so that you can coordinate um, all this information. Sure thing, thanks Kate. Uh, we can get the ball rolling with a question that was sent in on Facebook from WJ. I do have a question on the Osprey whose numbers have grown. They're everywhere, just a personal query. How do these numbers affect the fish population? It's a great question. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly based on osprey preying on fish, but they are a natural predator for fish species, particularly in the near shore environment. Um, I'm not sure where you are located, um, but I'm Mary, do you wanna add to that conversation? I think what I would say is, first of all, that's a good point in terms of understanding need, the desire and need to understand the overall ecological system and food webs and how species connect to one another. Um, though the, in the larger term, the impact of osprey is relative to some of our other fishing pressure, as well as water quality and habitat pressure um, is most likely lower. Um, but if there's a specific area where ospreys have really grown in abundance, that idea of trying to um, make that connection would be a research project. I don't know of any specific data that's currently available on that topic. Well, thank you. Next question dropped in the chat is from Janet asking where you can get the devices that you taught us about, Bob. Yeah, so there are many different types of design devices. The one I showed you in this presentation is called a sequelizer which was created based out of Miami. Two fishermen saw this problem, got innovative, created this device, and now they have a thriving business. So it's a pretty exciting story. But that is one particular descending device that you can find out on internet, that you can find them in local tackle shops um, and fishing stores of that nature. Particularly in Southeast Florida, I think they're a little more prevalent. Um, I'm located in Savannah, Georgia, and they are not as easy to find as we would like. So we actually, that's why we've been working with fishermen in the area and actually giving them the same devices to use. Um, the hopes is to eventually get these to be broader scale. So they'll be up in Bass Pro shops and things of that nature. For the time being, let me check. I don't wanna claim a web place, but Amazon type of place or your local tackle shop or local fishing guide may can point in the right direction to find these. We can also create your own. These are not, these are commercially available to selling devices, but there are certain rules and the regulation that the council has where if you are up for it, you can create your loan as long as it meets those requirements. 
So they're aligned for fishery innovation, which is very important to the fishermen to improve this process. Thank you so much. And while you were speaking, I saw a hand go up and I wasn't fast enough to see who put it up. So I'm gonna to move to another question that's in the chat. And if whoever that was wants to raise their hand again, I'll catch you next time. Um, I had another question from Mike in the chat. They noticed red snappers seem to have distended tongues in some of the pictures. And they were wondering if that was a result of the barotrauma you were referring to. Yes, that is a result of the barotrauma. And not to say tongue you see is actually their stomach coming out of their mouth. So the gases really inflate everywhere in their body, their swim bladder, their stomach, their eyes, everything. So that tongue you see is a stomach. And one of the reasons that people are moving towards the same devices, because many fishermen innocently, but sometimes falsely equate that tongue to that tongue area to a swim bladder. And they try to pop it to make it go back down to the bottom. When in reality, they're popping the stomach. And that is very lethal to the fish, you can imagine, I would think. So that's why kind of using this idea of poking the fish, getting away from that, to maybe now doing this kind of lip clamp that automatically opens, less harmful to the fish and ultimately more effective. Thank you for that clarification. Next question we have is coming in from Facebook from Susan. Is there a transcript of this webinar or can it be viewed again? And that might be a question for Kate to let us know all the different places we might be able to access this later. Yes, you can. So um, immediately following the conclusion of today's event, you'll be able to go to our Facebook page and be able to rewatch it and share it. And we hope you do. Um, also, if you're interested in getting a full transcript or if you would like a recording emailed to you, um, please feel free to email me at kate, K-A-T-E dot brown at tnc.org. And we'll, I'll drop that in the chat box as well. If Rachel, you can um, also drop that in the Facebook chat box. That way anyone can contact me with any questions or requests. Thank you so much. We have a few more questions about the devices for Bob, um, are the devices expensive and do you find that they're being widely used? It's a great question. So there's a very, they vary in price. Again, as I said, you can make your own. So just cost materials from there, but it goes up as high as maybe around $50, which is a sequelizer I showed you. That's probably the most expensive device on the commercial market. So $50 is what you'd be running for kind of more quote unquote, high tech version. Um, so in reality to the cost, it costs fishermen to go offshore to fish. It's not that expensive of a device. And I know fishermen that have been using this device for years and have the same one they bought years ago. So they are being widely used. Um, actually, my dad is a fisherman and he talks all about his fishing shows and the guys are showing these things on the shows, talking about fishing and using design devices to help improve bear trauma. So I'd say the word is getting out there. We're doing more though, because we need to make sure that everybody knows about this. So that's where all you can help too. Talk to your fishing buddies and tell them, hey, there's this cool device. It's actually now a regulation to have on board if you're fishing for a snapper grouper. So yeah, we're really trying along with all our partners to get the word out about the same devices. Thank you so much, Bob. It was brought to my attention, it looked like it was EK that raised their hand um, earlier that I missed and I'm so sorry, but if you'd like to unmute yourself to ask your question now is a good time. Or if anyone else has any questions, we want to offer the space to uh, unmute yourself and ask that yourself, or um, we'll just pause for a few more seconds to allow any more further questions to come in. And in the meantime, Hannah, we might have had um, a couple more questions that were submitted in advance through registration. Did we relay those already? Not yet, but I can pull them up. We did have one question from Elizabeth and Jim 
about whether or not you've appeared on Ron Shara's show in Minnesota um, to share about this awesome technology. So I'm super psyched that it sounds like this is something that people want to learn more about. Yeah, I have not had the pleasure of being on that show. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I know actually David Moss, who is down in Southeast Florida, is working with different fishing shows and um, I guess they're called Instagram influencers. I'm not, I'm not a tech person, so I'm not sure. But guys who really have a presence on social media and in television with fishing to try to get on their shows to get this message across. So we are working in that realm because even better this message coming from us it coming from the fishermen themselves is worth its weight in gold. And that's why building trust with fishermen is so important from the beginning because you build this relationship over time. Awesome. And I did pull up those other questions. Thank you for the reminder, Kate. Um, how can consumers support sustainable management? We've talked a lot about anglers and how can regular consumers that aren't out on the water help support sustainable management of fisheries. I can chime in on this, but Mary, I know if you would like to go first and then I can come in after you. I know you've been spoken for a bit. Um, sure, well, there are a couple of different ways. One is to um, get an understanding of um, where your fish come from and um, what the sustainability of that population is. So they're, um, you know, working to fish local so that you get your fish from a local provider where um, you're supporting the community as well as, um, and the fishermen, as well as getting your fish. And then there are several different um, stores and organizations like Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, South Carolina Aquarium has picked it up as well. They kind of describe the status of um, fish populations as it relates to um, the health as, you, as a consumer of fish. And then the other side of it, <laughs> is really the side that deals with understanding that what we do along the coast, be it um, disposing of trash, thinking about plastics, thinking about water quality, thinking about um, issues that we raise to conserve land, um, you know, have strong policies as it relates to water quality, help the fish themselves. So all of us have the opportunity to think about individual decisions that we make um, and how that can create a healthier ocean in the long term. Awesome. Yeah, I, I second everything Mary just said. Um, and yeah, really understand trying to buy and purchase local seafood because you're helping keep the fish local. So you're cutting down transportation and carbon and things of that nature, but you're also helping your local fishermen which are part of your community. So it's also a community support in that regard as well. Cody wrote in a question in the chat, what app was shown that the fishermen can use to help share data? That app is called Release and it is um, through the South Lake Fishing Management Council. And I actually included the link within the presentation and I can actually share that again or I can make sure Kate shares that link again once the presentation is over if you're interested in downloading that app. It's very user-friendly. Um, I know the council is eager to have lots of fishermen use it. Um, so yeah, there's lots of apps. Release is one app. There's also an app called My Fish Count. That's through the Angler Action Foundation, where it's essentially like a logbook for your fishing activity, but that also helps provide data to the fishery management agencies help with their management actions. So um, if you look on the council's website, they have a bunch of things about electronic reporting in that regard that you can be part of. And Mary just shared it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And Cody, we saw your hand was raised. Did you have anything else to follow up with your question? You're welcome to unmute yourself now. If not, we'll move on. We have another question from WJ from Facebook. What's the spread of information for the device? For example, how is the device being advertised? Where can people go to learn about it? 
So a slew of organizations are trying to provide outreach about the same devices. Um, the South Atlantic Fish Management Council actually has a best fishing practices um, webpage on their um, website that kind of provides you all the different information throughout the South Atlantic region from local governments, from um, industry manufacturers about these devices and about using them properly and are saying the signs of bear trauma. So I say that's a great first place to go. Um, we actually have a couple articles also on nature.org where we talk about our fishing work and links to these types of ideas. So you can find it there as well. Um, I know also, even though it's outside the South Atlantic region, the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council is also doing a lot of outreach with this. So it's not just the South Atlantic that has this issue, it's also the Gulf of Mexico, the other side of Florida. So we're trying to um, really spread the message throughout the entire Gulf of Mexico, South Atlantic region where there's a large recreational population there. Um, as a kind of side note, the same devices were actually kind of first conceived actually out in the Pacific where they were talk, fishing for rockfish, which is a deep water fish out on the West Coast, where they're going through bear trauma. And these design devices really helped improve the fish population there and get better numbers to more effectively manage fisheries. So we're taking a lesson from the West Coast and bringing it East Coast. Bob, if I, I have a question actually, just to piggyback on that. Um, if someone in the community were to either want pamphlets or information to have at their own bait shop or you know they know of a place that would be a good uh, spot to have this outreach. Um, is there somewhere or someone that they could reach out to to notify us to you know flag that for us? Sure well a lot some of our great partners through the Sea Grant so Florida Sea Grant, Georgia Sea Grant, South Carolina Sea Grant they have great information about this that they do spread to their fishing industry partners. When it comes to bait shops I know I've distributed things locally in Georgia. Dave is working on that in Southeast Florida. So lots of people are trying. Um, but if you want to contact myself, David Moss, we can get you in contact with Sea Grant Partners. We can get you in contact with the council. Lots of different people are trying to push this forward. Um, and the bait shops are really, it's like the water cooler talk for fishermen essentially. So that's a good place to start as far as getting this message out. So it's a great point. Great. So I'll drop your email address in the chat box then. So if anyone um, does have, it seems like we had a few suggestions of places. So I wanted to make sure those made it to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Seems like we have a few more moments for a few more questions. It looks like EK asks, does the bear trauma affect fish close to the shore? Well, that's relative, I guess, for what's close to shore, because some fishermen fish like 200 miles offshore. When we're talking about bear trauma, it's really depending on the depth. So if you have it where there's depth of at least 33 feet or below, that's what's called a different atmospheric pressure change in the water. So essentially below that depth, you have the potential for bear trauma. Sometimes 33 feet is very close to shore, such as in Southeast Florida. Sometimes it's very offshore, like here in Georgia. So that's all relative, but it's about the depth. So if you're fishing, I'd say 33, sometimes 50 feet and below, the chance of running a bear trauma increase significantly. It also depends on the species. Some species of snapper grouper are more prone to bear trauma than others. Red snapper is one of those that is very prone. Um, so it depends a little bit on the fish you're catching and how deep you're fishing. That's a great segue to one of our, probably one of our last questions here. What are the most commonly fished deep water fish species? Again, great question. It also depends on where you are and what season you're fishing. So, cause certain fish are closed during the year for different reasons. Red snapper, for example, there's actually only maybe a few days, usually in July, where that fishery is open for fishing. And it is a very popular recreational fish for sportsmen in the Gulf and the Southeast and South Atlantic. In the South Atlantic, it's open for a few days in July. The Gulf has a different system where they have a longer season, but that's why it's so important to use these descending devices because if you're fishing for this fish outside the season, you have to return it back to the ocean. And if you're returning it to the ocean, it's going through bear trauma and it can't swim back down, it's 
going to float there like that picture I showed, and it then ultimately will die. So that's why it's important to really understand the season you're fishing, what fish you're fishing for, and the depth, and really have that descending device on board, rigged and ready to go if you encounter bear trauma. And as consumers too, it would be good for us to know more about what's in season and where we are locally, right? Exactly. Yes, and Mary, I think you had a point to add. Yeah, I was also going to say that, you know, we're talking with Snapper Grouper about a fishery that is managed federally for the most part, that there is some Florida state-based management of that fishery, given how close they are to shore. Um, but when we think about our recreational fisheries and some of the things that we're trying to learn in terms of building relationships, there is also such a great estuarine recreational fishery, which has a different suite of species that they're looking to um, harvest and catch. Um, so thinking on that end of it too, that our emphasis has been on this offshore from a regional standpoint, but the relationships forge back and forth between state and offshore managed fish. Thank you so much for adding that, Mary. Yes, I know snook is a popular down there in Florida. So um, yeah, you guys got some good fish down there in your estuaries and your mangrove forests. Great. Well, I don't mean to cut um, this too short, but we are coming up on three o'clock Eastern time, which is when the event is supposed to end. So I just wanted to wrap this up. However, we really appreciate all of you attending the um, lecture event today. And thank you again, Mary and Bob, for joining us to um, tell us all about the wonderful projects that's going on. And if you are joining us via Zoom, a quick poll will now pop up on your screen. Just three questions. And we truly appreciate your feedback. If you weren't able to address your question today, or if one does just arise in the future, feel free to email me at kate.brown at tnc.org. And again, my email will be dropped into the chat for that. And this concludes our lecture event. Um, and actually it concludes our winter lecture series this year. So um, we thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us at other events for the remainder of the year. You can sign up for future things at nature.org slash volunteer. And we look forward to having you join us at next year's uh, Winter Lecture Series um, come next January. So thank you again all and have a wonderful day.